Hi, this is Jim Bergman with True Tech Tools. Today we're going to go over one of the coolest tools I've seen in a long time, the Fieldpiece SDP2 Dual Index Psychrometer. This is probably one of the must-have tools that I've seen that every technician should really get into their toolbox. It does some really cool things, not only including wet bulb and dry bulb, but also enthalpy directly on the instrument and differential enthalpy, which makes it very easy to calculate capacity in the field. The SDP2 comes with the instrument, a supply air probe, a return air probe, a blow molded case, and a couple of cones to hold the probes in the duct when you're making your measurements. The probes both have vinyl covers on and you just slide the vinyl cover off to expose both the thermistor and the capacitive humidity sensor. The instrument measures both temperature and humidity at the same time and it uses that to calculate wet bulb temperature, dry bulb temperature, relative humidity, and you can send those readings to either an HG3 or directly to an S-Man 4 for target superheat calculation. The probes are marked at each end for the return air and supplier. Return air is red, the supplier is chrome, and the same thing with the plug-in, the return air is red again, and the supplier is unmarked. So we're going to go ahead and plug. Setting up the SDP2 is really easy. All you have to do is plug in the two probes. And again, just pay close attention to which one goes in the supply and which one goes in the return. They are keyed, so you're going to see that there's a small arrow here on the front. And you line that up with the front of the instrument and plug that in. Take the next one, same thing, line up the arrow with the front, plug it in. Then after you get them both plugged in, just press and hold the power key. The instrument will power up and we're ready to go take a measurement. The SDP2 comes with a couple of probe stops we're going to use to hold the probes and the return air and the supply air duct. If you've watched any of my videos before, you've seen me make a lot of measurements in my duct work, so I already have holes here. So I'm going to go ahead and screw this in to the return air. And it screws in so it locks in tight, really good and tight. And I'm going to back out the set screw here. And then I can pull the probe out, slide the probe into the duct, and then go ahead and lock that down about mid-position in my duct work so that I get a good sampling of the return air. The wires that come on the probes are really nice and long, so in this case we're going to put this one in the supply probe. And when we install this in the supplier duct, you want to make sure that you're far enough away from the evaporator coil that the air's had time to mix. So you can see here, I'm several feet away from my furnace. The air's had time to turn in there. I don't want to be too close to the coil when I make the measurement or I'm going to get some oddball readings in there. Air has to mix and turn a little bit before we get a good measurement up. So I drilled the hole here, and now I can put the probe into the duct. I'm going to go ahead and point the sensor here into the air stream so I get a really nice, fast response for the supply air temperature measurement. Again, I'm going to go ahead and clamp this in here snug. All right, so when you look at the instrument itself, there's just a couple things I want you to note here. Parameter allows us to select our, our units of measure. So in parameter here, I'm going to be per pound. Now I just went to dry bulb, uh, relative humidity, wet bulb, dew point, back to BTUs per pound. And I have it set up right now for differential. There's a small delta here. I'll show you in the display in a second here. I'll zoom in a little tighter. But then here at the bottom here, we've got our, our uh, delta button. It'll show us now our max, minimum readings, um, min max, which is our actual reading right now, and then hold, and then back to differential, power backlight button, and then our sync button if we're going to sync this up with an HG3 or an S-Man 4 for real-time uh, uh, target superheat calculations. Okay, so right now I have the instrument set up to measure differential enthalpy, and you can see we have a very tiny change in enthalpy, and that's uh, just the drift of the instrument. That's, that's pretty normal. There could be a, a small amount of uh, residual cooling in my ductwork and duct in there. Uh, I'm not sure when the last time my air conditioner kicked on here. If you leave the probe set to ambient air, it'll actually go down to zero. I've seen it happen over and over again. So the, the instrument's very, uh, very accurate. Well, we're going to go ahead and we're going to turn on the cooling, and we're going to take a look at the differential enthalpy, and I'm going to show you very quickly how to do a field... Uh, calculation of the capacity of the piece of equipment. Okay, so I got the cooling started and you can see very quickly as the cooling coil is cooling off that the enthalpy or the change in BTUs across the coil is changing very quickly. So uh, we're going to let this run for just a minute and stabilize. Now this is an ECM motor so it's ramping up slowly in the profile and that's why we're seeing this pretty substantial change in enthalpy. We're going to see that drop back down here as the lower gets up to speed. Uh, this is a two-stage appliance, so we're on second stage right now, and we're going to let this run for a few minutes, and we're going to see where the enthalpy settles out. 
Okay, so the unit's been running for about 10 minutes or so, and it's sort of stabilized here at about 7.2, 7.18 uh, BTUs per pound change in enthalpy across the evaporator coil. So we're going to go ahead and uh, do a quick calculation and see what the actual BTU capacity is. So just for ease, I went upstairs here just to show you what was going on here. Uh, mode AC2, so I'm on second stage cooling. And you can see here I have an ECM motor with a communicating stat, and we're moving about 1,078 CFM of airflow. So we're going to go ahead and use that number for a calculation just to make this quick and easy. Okay, so now that we've got CFM and enthalpy, the calculation's really easy. BTU output equals 4.5 times our CFM times our change in enthalpy. And so we're going to go ahead and calculate that out real quick. So 4.5 times 1078 times our change in enthalpy, which is 7.17 equals 34781. That's the capacity, the fuel capacity I'm measuring right now of my appliance. If I divide that by the nominal capacity, which is 36,000 BTUs, that's about 96% of its rate of capacity. Now, it's not abnormal for us to be a little bit below a rate of capacity, especially on a day like today. It's about 70 degrees outdoors, so I don't have a lot of condenser pressure driving that refrigerant through my metering device. And even though I have a TXV, um, you know, I may not have full capacity out of the TXV. And second, uh, the second thing that's important to remember is my return air temperature is about, well, let's see what it is here. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, change the parameter here and we're going to get off this and go to return air dry bulb is about 71 degrees and that 71 degree return air dry bulb is also going to reduce my capacity a little bit and same thing with my relative humidity uh, which is running uh, we're a max here so I'm going to go ahead and get off the max reading and uh, min min max okay relative humidity returns about 58 percent which that's that's decent that's not too bad so we're, we're running right about where I expect to see. But 96% of our rate of capacity uh, is pretty spot on for what we'd expect to see as results uh, when we're doing the measurements in the field. Okay, so one of the other really neat things I want to show you here is uh, we're going to go ahead and shut the system off. So it's going to take uh, just a second. I said somebody have to turn the thermostat to the off position. And I want you to keep a close eye on your enthalpy and I want you to see what's going on here because this is just one of the cool things when you start getting to make multiple measurements and measure supply and return air simultaneously uh, that you'll get to see. So you can hear my ECM ramping down and you can see my change in enthalpy is going away and it'll go away really quickly because the cooling is going to stop and essentially we're going to lose that change in heat. So this is dropping down, we'll give this just a second and you can see how quickly after the unit shuts off that our change in enthalpy goes away but that's really not what I want to show you. So let's give this just a minute to get down close to zero and then I'm going to go ahead and make a change on the instrument. Okay, the fan just slowed down a little bit more and you can see my change in enthalpy is down to about 1.4, 1.5 which is uh, you know about a sixth of what it should be We'll let that go a few seconds longer here and we'll get it down below a change in one. Okay, we're getting pretty darn close there. Now that we're down below a change in one here, I want to show you uh, something that's interesting. So when I look at my change in enthalpy, it's like really low, but when I look at my change in dry bulb, now we're, we're at differential dry bulb, I still have a change of 10 degrees, right? 10 degrees. Now I'm going to go over here and I'm going to hit parameter again. I'm going to look at my relative humidity. I have a change at 42%. Now, if you look what happened here, I went from 58 return error, which is what we were at before, and now we're at 100% relative humidity. Well, what happened here is we went from mechanical cooling to evaporative cooling. And even though there's no change in energy across the coil, let's go back and look at enthalpy real quick. And uh, we're min-max mean hold and hitting the wrong button here. Let me go back to uh, parameter, which is return and wet bulb dew point, BTUs per pound. I'm going to get off max min. Now we're back to the regular reading. You can see 26.42, 26.03. Even though there's almost no change in enthalpy, if I go back to dry bulb temperature, you can see I still have a 10 degree change in dry bulb temperature. Now, remember, energy is neither created nor destroyed. So what happened here is that the cold water in the coil, uh, it's it's 
now evaporating that water, that the warm air from the return is going to cross that coil, it's evaporating that water, and we're actually getting a little bit of free cooling. Now, you're getting free cooling, but you're getting that sacrifice of dumping the relative humidity that we just removed, uh, or just retained on the coil, back into the, back into the supply of the house. So if your main concern is controlling relative humidity, you may want to consider shutting that fan off. If your main control is cooling, and uh, you know, especially sensible cooling, and like if you're in Arizona or something like that where you, you don't have a lot of humidity to deal with, you might want to put that back in the house, then we can keep that fan on continuous circulation. Now, for me, and I'm in Ohio, and we're pretty humid here, but that gain in humidity is pretty negligible. I mean, when I look at it as, you know, we pulled it out, what was running, whatever drained down the drain, drained down the drain, whatever was uh, on the coil, still on the coil, once the unit shuts off, I'm just getting a little bit of free cooling, evaporative cooling. Well, the humidity is going to rise a little bit again anyway, but because I have a two-stage system, it runs so much that the controlling the humidity is not really uh, an issue. So I run my fan all the time so I can take advantage of my electronic air cleaner, but I just thought you might think this is cool because at first it caught me off guard. It's like, holy cow, that relative humidity went all the way up to 100% relative humidity. You can see it's still there. That coil is really saturated, so we're just continuing to put that water in there. But what's really cool again is when you look at that dry bulb temperature, that's wet bulb, no change in wet bulb. Uh, there's my dew point temperature, BTUs per pound. There's my dry bulb. I still have, if I go differential here, 9.5 degree change across the coil. So as long as that fan's running, I'm getting a little bit of cooling out of the system still. And again, only at the sacrifice of adding the relative humidity back into the ductwork. So one more really slick feature of the SDP2 is the fact that it has target evaporator exit temperature calculation and also target differential te uh, temperature. Both sort of the same thing, but I want to show you how this works. So if I go ahead and press the, the uh, target evaporator temp button, what happens here is it shows me the target evaporator temperature is 52.5 degrees, that's what this TET uh, -E is, and you can see that I'm right there, perfect, within zero to tenth of degree of what it should be. I press that button again, and it shows me my target temperature drop is 1.7 or 17.2 degrees and I'm within 3 degrees right now of what that calculation should be and I think I just switched from uh, from my low to my high stage of my appliance here so that's why we're seeing a small change then I hit it again and I go back to my return air dry bulb and supply air dry bulb and then you know can cycle back to the units so really really cool feature here allows me to see things like uh, you know, if my evaporator is performing properly, if I have air bypassing my coil, and how far away I am from that temperature. You know, right now you can see it's coming right back down in the line where we'd expect it to. So it allows me to very quickly assess if I have a problem. So this is really slick because it's sort of a verification of correct airflow. Measuring capacity is probably one of the most powerful tools you're going to ever use to show your customer how efficiently the system's working. Although the capacity does vary with the outdoor air and the load, when you have charge and airflow problems, you'll see huge variations in the capacity. In fact, your capacity typically will be very low. Anything we do with airflow, and especially low airflow, uh, will cause a direct decrease in system capacity. And if we're overcharged or undercharged, we'll also see direct impacts on capacity. Using the field piece SPD2, and a couple other instruments like the Fieldpiece STA2 and an S-Man 4, you can get a system working almost factory perfect every single time. The key is, again, correct airflow, correct charge, and then testing the system to make sure that it operates the way that it was engineered to operate. If you do those couple of steps and you get that right every time the first time, you will get system operation like you've never seen before. Not only will you increase your customer comfort, but you're going to find problems that result in billable hours that you can make money on. So again, take a close look at the SPD2, take a look at the STA2. We have a really good kit that combines all three instruments together to reduce cost, but I can't say enough about this instrument. Uh, seeing enthalpy for the first time, seeing it measured directly was really, really cool. And then, you know, along the way too, you start to gain a better understanding of what's happening in the ductwork, what's happening with the psychometrics, what's happening with the wet bulb, the dry bulb, the humidity, and it really starts to make air conditioning come together. So this is Jim Bergman with True Tech Tools. I really hope you enjoyed the video. It was fun to do, and I, like I said, I learned a little bit myself along the way. Um, but if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to post them in the video below. 
And if we can do anything else to make your job easier, let us know.